Welcome to the Chaos Data Science Working Group meeting for May 22nd. The question of the day is, if you could only listen to one album for the rest of your life, which one would you choose? I have mine. Looks like Sophia's trying to find a quiet space, but we'll give her a minute. It's mine are Ziggy Stardust and Bad Out of Hell, because those are the only two albums that I regularly listen to, like the whole thing. Or Purple mm. Rain's up there too. I'm gonna be indecisive. So the rest of your life is so, so okay. So it is something like a course, right? So you have to <laughs> listen to it. So okay, then I go for it. Cool. Yeah, I don't know about the first thing. I just feel like there's the albums I play on repeat or the ones I tune out. <laughs> I didn't mean it like a curse. I meant like, what are what are awesome albums that you would love to listen to over and over and over? <laughs> <laughs> um, That's also, are you question? Oh wait, what is? Oh, weird. Sorry. There you are. No, I didn't realize this. I'm using a new room, and when I plugged into the monitor, it switched to the monitor camera and not my camera. So oh. I didn't know why it wasn't on, but I hope it's not sensitive behind me. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just blur that out. It seems like some architectural drawing. <laughs> if it is, it is not very complex, so don't worry, because... Hey, it's gone. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we have, uh, oh yeah, that's a good one, the White Album. Um, oh no, Luis is adding more. I like this one, but uh, I'm not going to judge because I added three for the rest of my life. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so I think you both saw that I took, we had that big doc, which we had created in the OSPO working group, which had a whole bunch of potential projects. And it was, it was unwieldy, it was a bit hard to parse. And so I took all of that and split them out into actual projects and then created GitHub issues around them. I would say none of the projects are particularly well-defined right now, except maybe, maybe event location inclusivity is probably slightly more well-defined than some of the others. But, um, but you can, here, I can share my screen actually. That might make it easier. Okay. So here we've got the project list. So these were the things that we had discussed either, either within that OSPO working group in that document, or we had a couple of, of others like take off and exodus, which we discussed here in this, in this working group. So I split them all out. And at this point, I think we're looking for people who are interested in working on them. I know, uh, Luis, you mentioned sudden archival is something you were interested in. Uh, personally, I'm kind of interested in in license change, and I've got some like the beginning of a of a data set for that. Um, I'm curious, Sophia. I know you worked in that doc a little bit. I'm curious if you have any thoughts on on the the projects. Like, does this seem like the right breakdown? I think so. Cause I feel like there are a mixture of levels, which is nice. Um, like I think the event inclusivity one, I know you have a slotted space to talk about that later, but it's a bit of a, a rat, it could be a rat hole. So I think what we're kind of working on now is just trying to come up with a reasonable scope 
before mm -hmm. we even push it forward because I think it, it could get a lot bigger than just the three of us working on it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think knowing, like if people know that part of taking it on is that they have to settle on the scope that makes sense for them, I think that will hopefully make it more tenable. Like I think saying, here's a project, you figure out how to answer this question that you didn't pose. I think that's gonna be a lot harder. Um, but I also think that we could use this space to help frame questions and make them more applicable to anyone who work, who's working on them. So like, I think I'm, I'm, I could, we could use that as a constructive space. So in general, I, I like how you split it out and I think it makes sense. Um, I'm just curious how we, how we get people interested. Yeah, agreed. I know at, we've had people come into the data science working group meetings and in the Slack channel who are interested in specifically in working on projects. And, um, and historically, we just, we just haven't had anything to give them. So I was hoping that by creating some, some issues, we would, we would have something that we could give people, give people to work on. So we do still need to get people interested in these particular projects or people can propose their own. So we've got an issue template around that. If there's some other projects that people want to work on, but I do to your point, um, the people working on the project, the first step is going to have to be scoping, scoping the project and possibly redefining it. So, you know, I've proposed some basic definitions and kind of an initial question, but I think all of these are going to require a lot more, a lot more detail and some work, I think, before before people really get started. I think it would be appropriate, though, to have those conversations in this space, given if we have a, like a light agenda, we could dedicate 10, 20 minutes to talk about a thing mm -hmm. um, with those that are interested in it. Yeah, absolutely. And I... <laughs> <laughs> Ah, oh, conference rooms where the lights turn off if you don't move around. Enough. It's very sensitive. That was like five minutes and it shut <laughs> off. <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. And I think the that what I what I want to do with the data science working group meetings is is devote some time in every single meeting to working on some projects. So depending on on who's here and what people what people are interested in, I think that that's something that we can that we can work on. Um, you mentioned Sophia. You mentioned the event lo uh, location inclusivity. Do you want to give an update on that one on where we are? Sure. Um, in our last meeting, we kept expanding our scope. <laughs> which is part of the reason to kind of clamp it back. Um, but then we weren't actually able to meet the last two times because of scheduling issues. So it's kind of, I don't say that it's stalled. I think we have something on the calendar. It's just moving slowly. Um, mm -hmm. And it's sort of, we're trying to figure out how best to do what we can and then also expand it to the community. I think the biggest challenge is just the consistent availability of data in all regions, depending on what we would want to propose to add to the metric. And so we're thinking sort of the proof of concept is just find, seeing what we can find and then also seeing how we could set up a structure such that others can add data that they find and make it more of a crowdsourcing and collaborative effort, recognizing that between the three of us, we're not going to find every possible data source on these types of issues and or statistics. So I think that's that's the kind of, I don't say that like it didn't, stall things, but it, it made it a bigger question, which is, can we use this particular project as a template to understand how we would crowdsource data like this into something usable for our, our users and our broader community? So it kind of opened up a big question, but I think it, it is sort of an interesting problem mm -hmm. um, to be able to have like an effective way to collect and aggregate data from multiple people, multiple sources. Um, then we would potentially scope out a separate project on those that would work on actually combining data sources and creating metrics. So that's like the sort of the aggregation point, the analysis or synthesis cleaning analysis component, which is probably the most complex. Um, and then the last piece where it got kind of interesting is that Elizabeth brought up the sort of nuanced perspective of individuals, which kind of opened up a whole other can of worms. Like, do we want to be able to allow people 
to comment on their own experience in particular locations and particular venues. And basically the example that kept coming up was how Fosse last year was co-located with a, an event that was ideologically opposed to half the attendees at Fosse. And there, this event was happening like around the corner. And thankfully there was not a lot of overlap. I think there was a protest at some point and I'm not even remembering who was protesting who, but it was definitely like there was disagreement amongst the constituents at the same physical conference center. Um, and that's like never something you're gonna be able to find and only can be reported on as like maybe a lack of awareness from the event site organizers that they co-located two events with highly opposed ideological backgrounds that could have created conflict. Um, yeah. And so we were wondering, is there a way to capture that sort of that event, but that like on the ground feedback? And then the concern there is then now you're moderating that type of content. And that I feel like is not something we want to take on because then there's also the potential for it to get really ugly and have code of conduct issues. And we wouldn't want to bring that into the space. So we actually found a couple of other communities that are already kind of doing this. So the thought process is maybe we would also not necessarily work with them directly, but have that as sort of an extended resource and not necessarily take that on. But yeah, there's just sort of the, the question of where where we want to collect data, who we want to collect data from, how we want to aggregate it, how we want to source it, and then what happens from it. So we're very much still in the framing, but it is introducing a lot of interesting questions of how projects like this could be designed. Cool. Yeah, it's it's not an easy project. Like the 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 data gathering and cleaning behind it is a problematic topic. So that's yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, any questions for Sophia on event location inclusivity project? Okay. Hey, Jonathan. We're just uh, working through the Hello. agenda. Hey. Um, okay, so next up, we also have the um, license change project, which which really which really is around can we can we predict the likelihood of a license change for an open source project um, from from open source to to not? Uh, Sophia, go ahead. Um. There is some data here that I really want to share with you, and in theory, I can share it in four to six weeks when the MSR proceedings are finally live. Um, there was an empirical study on license use in third-party package managers, and they did look at the rate of license change. Um, to be fair, they were mostly looking at license changes um, within sort of still the open source class. So it wouldn't necessarily reflect the business source or other types of more proprietary license changes. Um, but mm -hmm. it does give you a sense of frequency of occurrence. Um, and it's fairly low is what I remember. It's less than 10%. Um, and it had lower and higher rates of occurrence depending on the package ecosystem. Um, but that's just one piece of data that I'd love to share. I think the this particular question is more focused on the sort of business and restricted use license. I did just want to mention there is some precedent with at least changes in the open source licensing category. Yeah. No, thank you. That would be that would be really interesting. I look forward to I look forward to reading that. And maybe there's maybe there's some stuff that we can pull out of that just from a I don't know, the way that the way that they were thinking about it or from a methodology standpoint, there might be some some ideas we can get from that too. So that would be, yeah, that would be super, super interesting. And this yeah, is a I really, problem. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. I was just saying, I've been meeting to share it for a while. It's just not live yet and it's been irritating and I have poked the track chairs and they're like, soon. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, this one, this one is, I think, a little bit, a little bit problematic in that it is uh, such an incredibly rare event that I'm not sure, I'm not sure that we can predict it, right? It just doesn't, it doesn't happen very often. So, and I've been working with the to-do group to see if we can identify any others, but it's basically a list of, of 19 projects. So it's, it's, and those 19 projects exist over um, fewer repositories because like four of these are HashiCorp, two of them are Elastic, 
So, so the, the, the data set that we're starting with on the projects that have changed their license is, is quite small. Um, so I'm not sure, I'm not sure even that we can predict the likelihood of a license change, but I think it would be really interesting to, to look at it and see if there's, see if there's something interesting that we can, that we can pull out of it. Don, I understand that even if we cannot do it, uh, knowing that we cannot do it is, is a valid result. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's a good point. I guess I would be curious if you've started this, then we also have a template to list things as we find them. And I'm assuming at some point there might be a tipping point where we have a large enough sample size, but I'm curious, I don't know what that number is. And I'm assuming we have to be closer to the hundreds versus the tens. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what that number is either. Um, but the the data sets out there, and people can people can contribute to it. So I've got um, some suggestions for doing that. There's also some some notes for things that I think have had a license change, but I either couldn't confirm that they'd had a license change, or couldn't. Um, and that that's all detailed here. Uh, or they were so old that I couldn't get a repository for them um, on GitHub or the repository was located elsewhere. So there's a whole list of, of ones that people could people could dig into if they were interested in helping to build, build out the data set a little bit more. Any questions on the, the license change project? Do you have any idea of how to add information about the context the, I, I mean, in terms of business. So for instance, uh, we, we were affected by the change uh, uh, by Elastic because we were, our product uh, uh, was based on Elastic. And uh, as far as I rem remember, AWS, uh, they were making a lot of money deploying Elastic, Elasticsearch, I mean. Mm -hmm. Elastic was not happy about that because they had their own cloud service. So they wanted to re to to retain some part of the of the cake. So this is why they 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 changed the license. So maybe if somehow we are able to add that context that is not part of the code, I'm not sure if it is part of the discussions. But maybe you have more data to to predict that something may happen. Yeah, that's a really it's a really good question because I was I was thinking about that as well. Like um so you kind of mentioned like how many people how many people were were impacted by the by the change. Um and the other the other piece of data that would be really useful is like like what uh what type of of organization owns the the project. Um is it venture funded? Is it IP IPO? Is it um good point? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so like like the business business elements, which is really, I mean, I, I guess some of that you could get maybe out of like crunch base or something like that, but that's um this would be this would be pretty manual. But I do think that there are going to be some some other things like this that we're probably going to need because I think that those are going to be um, variables that would have a big impact, I think, on on the likelihood. I would definitely agree with that. I think if you have a way or some sort of structure for us to share contact sources, like I'm, I'm assuming the blogs won't go away. I know at least like one of the sources I had around the Elasticsearch debacle was like a, literally a Twitter link, which may or may not even be active anymore, which was part of, part of the extended rant of the parties involved. <laughs> not that that necessarily needs to be cited, but I think most of these major changes are accompanied by some kind of post or statement um, that might have some context on it. I mean, I think context might need to be coded manually, like say, was this business reason, community reason, acquisition or whatever labels you want to create that provide some sort of categorical 
or ta- sorry, catarchy. Wow, hierarchy or category, not a word. Um, but that I don't know. It's like I do feel like you'll you'll need to have sort of primary sources for any sort sort of analysis like that but maybe you can feed it into an LLM and it'll spit out a context but um to make that more automated uh but I I know I have some links hanging around from just prior things that I've written up as well so if you make that something either an issue or a table that we can comment on and provide more sources I think that's something you can crowdsource a bit as well versus having to manually find everything um I also suggested a a link in the meeting chat um devs.dev does show dependence um, so I just was looking at, say, the Elasticsearch dependence and could see Grimora Labs did it. Uh, so that record is still there. Um, I know that's not that Grimora Labs has updated to OpenSearch, but um, because of the versioning, you can see the, all the older versions that were dependents of it. Yeah, the dependent data is problematic um, because it's not in the AI, as you know. Mm. Interesting. So you can't pull the that dependency from... data is and I've asked GitHub about this multiple times and it turns out that computationally it's um it's just too resource intensive to wait from GitHub or from depth.dev the AP. oh from GitHub yeah we could use some stuff on maybe depth.dev mm-hmm. like well, I, I just little, put the link in... more yeah oh, yeah maybe it is more annoying to access just because of the way that the the data is, it sits on a table in BigQuery, but there are free tier and limitations to how many times you can call it. Um, but you, you do have it, you have it in and in here. I guess I shouldn't volunteer myself and my services on a recorded channel, but I guess I can query this. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> they haven't yelled at me yet for using all my, my free tiers. So I don't think I have a restriction, but yeah. if it's for my own project, I think it's justified. Yeah. I'll just say you know more about how to do this. Cool. All Any other questions on the, the license change stuff? Actually, I should put this in the issue instead of in some random. Uh... Well, maybe if we look for scientific publications, we can get a list of projects that uh, that where this event happened. I mean, where this uh, where they changed the license. Because I guess that uh, this is a very interesting topic. And the consequences are very are very important. So maybe there are some publications about that. Yeah. No, I'm I'm just thinking that it is it is it is quite quite uh, it is quite difficult, but uh, but obviously the result will be very very relevant. Uh, cool. Um, so I know Luis, you were also interested in sudden archival. Did you want to chat at all about that during this meeting? I know this is also yep. something that Chan was interested in. Yeah, I, I'm thinking. I'm thinking about the the way to start with this. So maybe uh, if I if if I draft uh, a list of steps that I have in mind. Uh, this will allow people to to participate and to discuss. So I think that the the first thing we have to do is to make sure that we can identify when a project uh, is archived, because I don't know if that information is available. If it is, we can start. If it is not, then we are done. <laughs> uh, so so and the second thing we will have to do is to create a sample set of projects and categorize them manually because I guess that some of them were were archived because of the of changes in the in the main company as you mentioned in the description or maybe they put they, they because they were basically dead at the time uh, they were archived so yeah 
Okay. Yeah, that would be good if you could take a look at that and maybe just put together some next steps and some thoughts on where to go with that. Yeah. I have to run, but I have also been thinking about this as well, but from the general perspective of project abandonment and how to identify and maintain things that are either just hanging out there being not worked on or actively unmaintained and either archived or not and but it has this explicit statement in the readme that this is no longer maintained um so i'm i'm paying attention to a number of projects that are looking on this and some of them are happening in the research community so um louise i can connect with you offline and just share what i've found so far it's not exactly this question but it's related um in the sense that someone else has also been collecting data on this it's bogdan who i think you've met before <laughs> Uh, so if you haven't seen this dependency abandonment research, um, I think it would be highly relevant to at least kick this off and help you frame your question. So I'll follow up with you separately. And it needs a drop. Um, thank you, Don, thank for you. leading this meeting. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. Yeah, this Bye. is something that I spent a lot of time um, at VMware thinking about because we would occasionally have teams who would come to OSPO and say, hey, we're going to, we're going to archive this project because we're not going to work on it anymore. Um, and I actually had a script that went out and looked at things like, um, how many, how many forks of the project are still active. So not like I forked this and never looked at it again, but I forked this and have kept it updated or have made some changes or have, you know, whatever. So that was one of the ways that I was looking at, um, and then, you know, of those forks, like how many of those were employees? Um, but in some, there were a couple of cases where, you know, the team wanted to stop working on it, but we had enough other people using the project that that just wasn't, it wasn't feasible. So, you know, from a, from a VMware perspective it was something that we didn't want to do because from a reputation standpoint, we thought that that was not the right thing. Um, but, you know, not every company is going to say that, right? They're just, you know, some companies will just be like, oh, we're done working on this. We're just archive it. Just chuck it, um, even if other people are are doing things with it. So so the forks is, uh, um, so like active active forks um, is, is at least one indicator of activity. Very interesting because one of the things that you mentioned is that the, the company is that they basically, they basically don't care about the, the levers of community, the levers of a community, uh, they are going to, to disconnect suddenly without yeah. any warning. So there is no way to predict that that event. Uh... Well, but you might be able to predict it that there might be like a decrease in activity from, you know, the people who work at the company that owns the project. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. There might be some things that we can look at. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Then maybe after checking that we can identify archive projects, we have to work on the hypothesis and gather a couple of them and start working. Yeah. Sounds like fun. Yeah, sounds very fun. <laughs> cool. Um, okay. We have we have reached the end of our agenda. Is there is there anything else we want to talk about today? Not me. How about you, Jonathan? Anything you wanna? No, anything I'm you wanna still, talk about? I'm still lurking and figuring out what each interest group is about. And it's <laughs> it's so fun. <laughs> Fair enough. That's that's totally totally valid. We hope we we hope you enjoy the data science working group. <laughs> <laughs> we usually have a lot more people than this um with the uh american memorial day holiday a lot of people are are just out i had several people tell me that they were on vacation this week and wouldn't be able to make it so when's memorial it, day i'm an american yeah. i should be should i be on vacation <laughs> yes you should be it's actually it's a bank holiday monday is a bank holiday here in the uk too um and we're we're doing a long weekend i've actually i've never been to i've lived here for almost 10 years and I've never been to Cambridge. Uh, so Paul and I are just gonna spend a, a weekend in, in Cambridge. So we're gonna go on Friday and Monday. And then Monday night, I'm gonna fly to Madrid for data and tapas. Ooh, that sounds like the best part. It does. Nothing against Cambridge, but. <laughs> <laughs>
yeah it should it should be fun welcome yeah, back let, yeah. let, let me know you want you want some tapas on monday night no i actually get in late because we're okay. uh because it's a bank holiday so i'm just gonna I'm, I'm taking a late flight in okay but thank you i appreciate the offer sophia's back we're just ending the meeting unless there's anything else you want to talk about <laughs> no i figured i of course i show up and this person is out of office and didn't reject the meeting so oh. Hey, I'm back. Free time. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. I will give you, I guess, 25 minutes back in your day, or uh, I guess 15 minutes because we end 10 minutes early. So everybody have, have a good one, and thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.